the 20th century was an explosion of physical innovation. We had air conditioning, television, Tupperware. <laughs> and while all these things made us cooler, kept us maybe a little more entertained, certainly kept our food more aptly preserved, we got to ask, did any of these things really make us happier? I mean, did they really increase the meaning in our lives? Maybe a little, maybe not. To increase the meaning and happiness in our lives, which I'm assuming most of us want to do, we need to shift the focus from physical innovations, how we make things, to social innovations, how we think about things, which is largely rooted in our education system. The current education system comes from a bygone era, the Industrial Revolution, where we focused on the parts, using the metaphor of the machine. We felt that if we could analyze and understand each of these parts really, really well, we could control them. We could manage them. And just because we go from one class to the next, one grade to the next, in a specific amount of time for each one, we're convinced that we're learning just because we keep moving down this conveyor belt. It's like we took a box of puzzle pieces and dumped them on a table and took a microscope and went down on each one to analyze them. And yes, while the 20th century was amazing at analysis, what we lacked was synthesis. How all these pieces fit together to make a unified landscape and how we belong in that picture. So why me? Why would I have any insight into what the world needs? I went to 12 years of public school. I memorized all my puzzle pieces. I passed all my tests. And I hadn't even thought about who I was or what my role in this world was. So I did what many of us so often do in this situation. I went to college. Four years and $150,000 later, this time I actually had thought about who I was and what my role in this world was. And this time I knew. I didn't have a clue. So I embarked on a new type of learning journey. And this time, however, the world was my school and life was my curriculum. This is what my classroom looked like. On the Blackfoot Reservation in Montana, I was invited to a sweat lodge. Sweat lodge is essentially a ceremony where we honor our relationships to one another, to nature, to our ancestors. It was here that I learned that I belonged to something much greater than just myself. I got caught in a flash flood in Maui. I spent six hours hanging onto the side of a cliff, letting the water subside. It was here that I learned of my need to respect the power of nature. In New Orleans, I learned what it is to fall in love. And working 126 hours for 43 days in a row on a fishing boat in the Bering Sea, I learned exactly what it is that I don't want to do for the rest of my life. <laughs> I spent seven years traveling on and off. And each time I returned, everything was the same except for me. As I experienced the world out there, I experienced the world in me. And I grew in complexity. I grew in understanding of the world and my role in it. There were no classrooms. There were no teachers. Yet everywhere was a classroom, and everyone was a teacher. So how do we make this shift to a world of learning that really makes us come alive? Well, we don't need to think about doing education in a new way, but rather asking the question, why do we do education in the first place? If we do it to maintain the status quo, we're doing a really great job. 
But if we're doing it to evolve our thinking, to evolve our species, to integrate and weave happiness and meaning into our lives, we need a new story. So while the 20th century held the metaphor of the machine, where we focused on the parts, the 21st century will hold the metaphor of the living system. Here we shift from focusing on the parts to focusing on the relationships between these parts. And as we begin weaving these parts together, we begin weaving ourselves into this story. And when we do that, we get to the first of three principles of 21st century education. Cultivate the self. Paulo Freire, the Brazilian educator, uses something called the banking metaphor within the realm of education, where the teacher comes along, opens the head of the students, deposits information to be withdrawn at a later date, usually a test, and often never to be remembered again. When we push in, we cultivate the intellect alone, but the literal root of the word education is educare, which means to draw out. When we're pushing in, we're getting this really beautiful roadmap of life, right? So we're going from one class to the next, one school to the next, one job promotion, one kid to the next in a specific amount of time. But life doesn't happen that way. So what we need is to cultivate the learner, to cultivate, rather than the roadmap, the compass point, the true north, understanding deeply who we are and what makes us come alive. Genius, the root of the word genius translates to inborn nature. Inborn nature and genius are alive in every one of us. Genius is not about being perfect. Genius is about being authentically us. Anyone can be everyone else, but only you can be you. And this leads to the second principle of 21st century education, where learning environments must create a space where we can cultivate and explore our genius. When we do this, and we come from this place, we're pulled to learn, pulled to explore, pulled to be creative. The genius is inside us, and the education draws it out. This is why Freire's banking metaphor, when realized, is so dangerous. Not because it makes us all memorize facts that we often don't care about, but because it robs the learner of the dance, of becoming authentically us. It puts us all dancing the polka, when maybe we want a tango, or salsa, or breakdance, or maybe we're called to do all of these. Yes, at times the education environment must lead but it also must know when to follow. I want to tell you a story about 15-year-old Lua Bay. Lua lives in Providence and had one of those beautiful entrepreneurial moments where you connect the old dots in a new way. On one of her walks to school, she realized three things. One, a homeless problem in Providence. Two, a lot of abandoned buildings, and three, a lot of these buildings had graffiti all over them. So what she wanted to do was spend five minutes, talk to her school, see if she could recruit some friends, maybe recruit a graffiti artist or two, fix up these buildings, and create a space for homeless people to move in, add value back to the communities. So Lua asked her principal if she could have these five minutes. The principal said no. The principal said no, Lua. That would take valuable time away from the, when the other students could be learning. Imagine if instead we said yes. We said yes, Lua. And Lua took those five minutes. And she talked to her class. And maybe she rallied up a couple of students. And maybe they got their families. And the community came out and spent a couple weekends fixing up these buildings. And maybe Lua got a couple graffiti artists to paint murals on the wall. And then maybe these homeless people who otherwise didn't have a home now did and were able to contribute and be part of the community. Instead of living in a world like this where Lua has a chance 
of breaking through and bringing her dream to life, we could live in a world like this, where dreams are blooming all around us. It's this spirit that Lua has that we so often deaden. It's this spirit that we need to embrace as we step into the future. So, what do we do about it? Well, here's where we steal a page from the 20th century playbook. How did physical innovation create a new world? It didn't fight against the existing model. It just imagined and created a better way that inspired other people to step into it. Henry Ford didn't create a law that made riding horses illegal. He just invented the car. Steve Jobs and Waz, they didn't go around blowing up all the factories that produce CD players. They just invented the iPod. So is it possible to hack the system of education? It's not only possible, it's happening. This is Mycelium. Mycelium is a learning lab that I'm developing with a couple of truly brilliant people. It's a place designed essentially for people to come alive, understand their authentic self, and create from that place of genius, which is the third principle of 21st century education. But mycelium is just one young flower in a field of learning that's blooming across the world. There are tens of thousands of us working on these new models that make learning truly come alive. But this is only part of the solution. The other part is in here with us. I want you to think about this. Who is a Lua in your life? A friend, a parent, a daughter? How can you say yes to them? And more importantly, what are your dreams? And how can you step into them? Because I promise you, if you do, one day, many years from now, when you're lying on your deathbed, this is one decision you will never regret. Thank you.